Good morning, Heartway fam. We are so glad that you tuned in today. Listen, before Pastor Danny comes and gives us an incredible message about being empowered, I wanted to give you a couple of updates. Listen, we had an amazing time last week. Someone got baptized as we went out and cleaned the beach. And so we're gonna be rescheduling again for another time to be able to go out and just impact our community. And speaking of our community, thank you so much for all of those that have given over the years to help Heartway continue to grow. And and one thing I just want to let you know, you hear us talk about giving, but truly giving is about how we impact our community. The where it goes is um, I wanted to bring you into that. So one of the things that we do here at Heartway, we make sure that we can get a chance to go out, feed the homeless, or if there's someone here at Heartway that needs that extra um, push to help them pay their electric bill, to pay their rent, we are that community. So I wanted to let you know, as you think about and you mull over about giving, Giving, know that when you give, God is understanding the commitment of your heart to be able to give back. So we are so glad that you are here with us on this crazy journey called life. So sit back and enjoy this wonderful message by Pastor Danny. Take care. Hey, hi everyone. Grand Risings everyone. How is everyone today? Good. How was your week? You know, I love to ask. Good week. Okay week. <laughs> so what I want to dive into right now is I want to ask you a question. Who gave themselves permission this week to go out and be great? Give me an like an honest answer. And it's okay if you feel like you could have done better. All right, so who gave themselves permission this week to give 120% of themselves to themselves? Okay, so just a few hands, and then I wanna ask you this, well, why didn't you? So is it because you don't feel, your, feel that you're great, in which you are? Um, is it because you don't believe in your greatness? So give me a hand. Well, I'll give you a hand. <laughs> um, so I wanted to dive into this because notice that I sell, no, notice that I said, give yourself permission to be great, right? So we have to give, we have to allow ourselves to do so. We have to allow ourselves to step into a space of greatness in which you already are because you're here, because you exist, because God has chosen you and you and you and you to be absolutely yourself in which you are already an embodiment of greatness. And sometimes I think we forget this because life is moving so fast, so fast. We have to take care of the babies and we have to take care of ourselves and the mom and the dad and work and pay the bills. And we forget about the part of us, our soul that is calling on that one specific dream so let me ask you this, and I feel like a lot of hands will go up. Who has a specific dream in their heart that they know their soul is calling to, but they kind of push to the side? Shoot, I'll raise my hand, right? And it could be for whatever reason possible. And if you haven't raised your hand, that means that you already stepped into that part of you, that you're already, you're already there, right? So who has already stepped into that part of them? I'll raise my hand again, you know? So I want today's breath work to be focused on that dream in your heart and your soul's calling. Forget everything else. Forget about the financial aspect that comes with it. Forget about the physical, mental, spiritual aspect that comes with it. I mean, you already are. So may you please ground your feet connect to this beautiful earth, connect to this beautiful space. I'm with you right now, this beautiful woman in front of me. And just take a deep breath in. Drop your shoulders as you exhale. Roll your neck if that works for you. Place your hands where they are comfortable. 
and I want you to bring that dream back into your heart. I want you to give yourself permission in this moment to be the 120%. I want you to envision yourself for these next 10 minutes giving yourself 120% to your dream, to your soul's calling. Bring that dream to your mind's eye and breathe into it. And let go. And just find your own breath. Find your own rhythm. And ask yourself quietly, what does 120% of me look like when I give in to my soul's calling? What does it feel like? I want you to feel this in your mind. I want you to feel this in every single cell of your being. Feel this calling in your heart. What is God calling you to do? Because I want you to understand that that calling has been placed in your heart, in your mind, and in your soul because God has assigned this to you for a specific reason. There's nobody else that can fulfill this calling the way that God knows that you can. Breathe in to that and let go of all that no longer serves you Feel the emotions associated with this calling. Is it sentimental? If there's happiness, envision yourself smiling, hugging your loved ones. What other emotions are associated with this? Feel it in your entire being. Feel it as it travels from the base of your spine all the way up your spine and let go deep exhale send that belly into the belly button into the spine and as we inhale we feel our lungs expand feel yourself expanding into this moment and we let go. We send the belly into the spine. We let go. And we find stillness. This dream that's in your heart, I want you to bring it in to all parts of you right now. What is standing in the way of you and your deepest dream? What was your dream as a child that someone told you, you can't do that, you're not good enough? I'm here to remind you that God needs you. God needs you to step in to this dream. You are the chosen one, my friend. And so we inhale for four seconds. One, two, three, four, and we hold for two, one, and we let go for six, five, four, three, two, one, find stillness. Feel the dream. Sometimes we veer away from things that are hard, but I'm here to remind you that just because it's hard doesn't mean it isn't possible. And we breathe in for four, three, two, one, and we hold for two, 
one let go beautiful do you feel that energy in the room right now do you feel how we together as a collective are raising the vibration of this room of each other of this planet place your hand on your beautiful heart and feel that dream I dare you to dream this week I dare you to wake up every day and step into your purpose and your God calling you are the chosen one my friend you are needed you're not wanted you're needed you are here for a specific reason feel your beautiful heart connect connect with your partner that's sitting next to you send them love send that dream love tell that dream I haven't forgotten about you I'm coming back and our last inhale together four three two one and we hold for two one and we let go that is so beautiful when you are ready you may come back into your mind your heart your body your soul i love you so much dream big my friends namaste amen mm, thank you Hi. Good morning. Happy Sunday. I want to give a shout out to uh, all of our leaders at Heartway who do just such an incredible job behind the scenes, making everything happen. Uh, I love you guys. You know who you are, everybody that um, steps up in such an incredible way. I love it because like the people who are really in the, in the inner core that run this whole thing, they don't, they don't wait for me. They're like, hey, we're doing this on this date, and this is how we're doing it. And I'm like, oh, okay, thanks. Perfect. <laughs> Thank God for you guys. Thank God. Yeah, and some of y'all who have been there before, you know, too, how it, how it goes. So anyways, I love you tremendously. And also, I want to give a shout out to uh, everybody that has stepped up financially to help contribute to the work that we're doing here at Heartway over the last several months as we were really iffy about our location and maybe having to move and dreaming and planning about what this community can evolve into in the future, we were very honest. I've been very honest from the stage about how important it is for uh, people to step up, people who call Heartway home and who love what we're doing to step up and contribute. And you've been doing that. And so I wanna applaud you and thank you and uh, tell you that what you are doing with your contributions matters tremendously. We see you, we honor you. We love you. Thank you. So this morning, I want to talk to you about how to live an empowered life. Uh, back in the day, I used to work in the rescue mission, Miami Rescue Mission. I worked with the homeless population. And I remember one homeless guy that I would talk to who was a part of our program who had applied to a bunch of different jobs. But the thing is, when you got a criminal record, sometimes it's hard to get some jobs. And it doesn't matter how you know, how long it's been since the last time you did something foolish, but it's on your record, it's like a stain, and it's very difficult sometimes for doors to open up, for opportunities to be given. And so this guy was telling me that he applied to a whole bunch of jobs, nobody ever got back to him. So what he decided to do was, he walked into one of the warehouses that he had applied to, and that never got back to him, and he just saw a broom, picked it up and started sweeping. One of the managers saw this guy, and she was like, hey, who are you? What are you doing? He's like, hey, I'm so-and-so. I need a job, so I'm just here sweeping. And she's like, yeah, but we're not paying you. And he's like, I know, but I'm just going to keep doing it until you're able to. Next day, the dude gets hired at the warehouse. Talk about living an empowered life. It's very easy when situations like that arise for us to become disempowered. Think about this individual's particular situation. 
So easy for your mindset to go towards that negative bias and orientation. Oh, my gosh, I'm not good enough. My past is going to haunt me forever. I keep applying everywhere and nobody wants me. All of these doors keep closing on me. I must not be good enough. I can't do anything about this. I might as well give up. You know how sometimes once we open and, you know, crack open that door, it's just a negative spiral. So easy for this man to have become disempowered in that way. Instead... Because he didn't victimize himself, he showed resilience, he showed commitment, he showed action, doors were open for him that otherwise probably wouldn't have been open. So all of us in one way or another have been in situations where we feel disempowered. Disempowerment is believing that our circumstances and conditions in life need to change in order for us to thrive. So to be disempowered is to give your power away. And the greatest power that you have is the power to choose your attitude in any given set of circumstances. We abdicate that power when we allow circumstances to define us, when we allow the narratives that other people create to limit us. And the way that we take that power back is by taking control of the way we are perceiving and interpreting the events of our life, as well as the responses and attitudes that we have when things don't go our way. You may not be able to change the situation, but you can change the way you see it. You may not be able to change other people, but you can always change yourself. And so taking that step of doing what is in your power to do is how you move from a place of disempowerment to empowerment. There's a bunch of stuff, of course, that's always going to be out of your control. And if we just cry and complain about all of the factors that are outside of our control, what is that going to do for us? How is that going to help us move forward? So at some point, we have to create that list of things I control, things I don't control, and focus on the stuff that we can Now, the feeling of disempowerment can take on many different forms. Sometimes it looks like retreating, isolating yourself, neglecting your responsibilities, hiding from the world. Anybody ever have that temptation? I've felt like that a bunch of times. It's like, you know what? I just want to crawl into a hole. I don't want to talk to nobody. I don't want to look at nobody. I don't even want to do anything. I give up. I quit. I'm gone. You know, sometimes we fantasize about, maybe if I just move, you know, and get away from it all. (laughs) then everything will be better. Other times, disempowerment looks like low, self, low self-esteem, lack of self-worth, right? Looking outside of ourselves for value and approval, constantly comparing ourselves to others and caring about what other people think, doubting ourselves, which is something we do very well. Other times, disempowerment looks like blaming Blaming God, blaming other people. Sometimes we blame ourselves. We make excuses for ourselves. When we are in a disempowered state, we lack inspiration, we lack creativity, we lack a sense of drive. And that all stems from this helplessness we feel because of all the stuff that is happening to us. But here's the deal. We may be affected by the circumstances of our life. We may be limited by some of the situations that we find ourselves in, but we do not have to be determined by them. You have the power within yourself to be a self-determining individual, meaning you have the ability to rise above the conditions and circumstances of your life and determine for yourself what this is going to mean for you and what you are gonna do with what life has given to you. All of us come across different limitations, biological limitations, psychological limitations, sociological limitations, and there's pros and cons to every situation that we find ourselves in, and all of our limitations also come with strengths. But the one thing in which we are all equal is in our ability to rise above the conditions of our life. Disempowerment is what happens when you give in to the conditions of your life. Well, this is just how it is and nothing will ever be different. Nothing can ever change. Empowerment is when you make that decision 
to grow beyond the conditions of your life by shifting your mindset. You're only ever experiencing what you're thinking and believing in your mind. All of the problems that you face in your life, you are experiencing in your mind. So this can be a prison or it can be a paradise. But in order for it to be a paradise, you got to learn how to work with your thoughts, your emotions, and shift your thoughts and emotions to align with reality. Because every time you argue with reality, you lose. So that's what it means to be empowered. It's living in harmony with the way things are. Life takes you left, I guess we're going left. And I accept this path as if I chose it for myself. Oh, life is going right? I guess I'm going right. I didn't choose it for myself, but I'm gonna Act as if I did. That's empowerment. And it'll take you very far in life if you're able to do that. I love this quote from Henry David Thoreau. He says, I know of no more encouraging fact than the unquestionable ability of man and woman to elevate their life by conscious endeavor. In the Hebrew scriptures, there's a story about uh, two men named Joshua and Caleb. And they were very close to the leader of the Jewish people at that time, Moses. And together they were going into the promised land. God had promised to give them a land that they can call their own. For years they were slaves in Egypt. And then they were nomads in the desert looking for a land they can call their own. God gave them a vision. There's a piece of land over there that's got your name on it. And it is a land where things are always flourishing. Flowing with milk and honey. Is that my phone ringing or somebody else's? Oh, I'm calling somebody. (laughs) Wow. I don't even know who that is. Who's Daryl? Gosh. That's so embarrassing. Now, the other day, you know what was funny? On Friday night, I was hanging out uh, with my friends at the Hard Rock, and I was texting somebody about the baptism on Saturday. And because this lady wanted to get baptized, I don't know if she's here uh, today, but uh, I was like, hey, I think we're canceling it. We're going to have to reschedule. She's like, yeah, that's fine. Um, You know, we'll just reschedule it. Okay, no problem. And then I I was taking a selfie of myself to send to somebody and I sent it to her. I was like, it's like 1045 at night. (laughs) Sorry. So funny. Can you imagine how embarrassing that is? I was like, well. I'm like, listen, everybody already knows, you know, it's just, it is what it is. Anyway, so Moses uh, sends these two men, Joshua and Caleb, to go and, and spy on the land because there's people that are inhabiting the land that God had promised the Hebrew people. So there's a group of 12 individuals that Moses sends to go take a look and see how things are there. Well, a bunch of the guys who came back said, we went into the land which you sent us, and it is as incredible as you say it is. It's a land that's flowing with milk and honey. There's so much fruit. It's a land of abundance. But the people who live there, they're really strong, really big, really powerful. And I don't know if we'll be able to go in there and kick them out, essentially. They were scared. Well, translate that into our context When God puts a dream or a vision in your heart, how often do we see what it is that we can become? We see where it is that our life can go. We see what God has for us, but then we start thinking to ourselves, oh, I'm not wealthy enough. I'm not social enough. I'm not good looking enough. I don't have enough influence. Everybody else has been doing this already. Everybody else wrote a book. Everybody else started the business. Everybody else has done this. What, who am I to step into this and try and do it myself? We talk ourselves out of the dreams that God has planted within our hearts. So that's what 10 of the 12 men that were sent into the land started to do. But then there were the two, Joshua and Caleb. And Joshua and Caleb had a different report. Look at what it says in the book of Numbers. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, you know what? We should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. 
But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. Isn't it funny how like the negative press gets more attention than the positive? That's how it's always been. And so then they said, the land that we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Well, guess how this story ends? It's kind of crazy when you read the Bible. God kills off all the other ten for their, uh, you know, <laughs> lack of faith, which is hilarious. But it's funny because it's the truth. <laughs> you read the Old Testament, God killing people left and right. I'm like, damn, this is worse than Game of Thrones out here, man. This dude... <laughs> It's like, God, what's up, bro? That's, 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 the, that's in the Bible, it's not me. <laughs> Anyways, the way this story ends is all of those other spies who had that bad report, they didn't get to inherit the land. Guess who did? Joshua and Caleb. What was the difference between Joshua and Caleb and the other 10 who did not get to inherit the promise that God had given to them? The difference is what they said to themselves. One group disempowered themselves with their self-talk. The other group empowered themselves by their self-talk. So never forget the most important words that you ever speak are the words that you speak to yourself. Because what you believe about life becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you believe you can't, you definitely won't. If you believe you're not capable, you won't find the capacity. If you believe you're not ready, you won't be ready. If you believe life is always working in your favor, it'll always work in your favor. If you believe that things are always against you, things will always be against you because what you believe about life becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So by shifting your self-talk, you can begin to shift your self-perception. And when you change the way that you see yourself, you change who you become. That's how it works. Now I want to introduce to you a, a really cool concept that I came across recently. It's called the drama triangle. And, and it could also be called the disempowerment triangle, in my opinion, which is why I'm sharing this with you, because we get, when we get into these dynamics, we become disempowered. But the, the concept of the drama triangle comes from the 1960s, uh, a psychiatrist. And the drama triangle is a framework that was created to give us a model that shows us how dysfunctional social interactions work when we get into conflicts and relational issues with one another. And it also illustrates the power games that we like to play. So the drama triangle outlines three different roles that we step into when conflict arises. The first role is the victim. This is the poor me mentality. The victim is always seeking sympathy by telling embellished stories about their pain and the wrongdoing that they have experienced. So a victim is unwilling to take responsibility for the undesirable circumstances of their life, for the role that they have contributed to the mess that has been created. And victims always completely put all of the fault on the other person. So you can know that this is the role you're taking on when it's all their fault. Victims, of course, feel trapped, hopeless, helpless. When we enter into this victim mindset, we feel like we are at the mercy of life. And uh, the victim is always seeking for people who will take their side and feel bad for them because they feel oppressed. The next role is the rescuer. The rescuer is the one that says, let me help you. The rescuer is a people pleaser that wants to fix other people's problems. And rescuers sometimes, out of their desire to people please and be on somebody's good side, tend to be enablers. So even if the person that you're supporting and helping is making decisions that are unhealthy for them, you, you're just the, the cheerleader. 
And you think that you're helping them by just being the cheerleader when really what that person needs is alongside of the cheering up, some honest feedback from somebody who loves them and cares about them enough to share with them what they see to be true. So rescuers are always intervening on behalf of the victim to try and save the victim from the perceived harm uh, of the persecutor because they derive their self-worth from helping other people. Rescuers also tend to meddle in other people's drama as a way of avoiding their own. So the rescuer has a need to be needed. And sometimes the rescuer will, will take on the role of the martyr, which means they're, they're willing to sacrifice themselves for the sake of helping everybody else around them. There is something beautiful and noble about that, but to what extent are you going to sacrifice yourself for the sake of other people? You know, you can do that to a fault where now you're neglecting your own needs. And then the last role that we take on is the persecutor. Okay, the persecutor is basically the self-righteous bully. Persecutors are, are there to shame you. And the persecutor actually fears becoming a victim, which is why they choose to make victims instead. Persecutors use guilt to control. They believe everybody is out to get them, so they have to stay on the defensive. And of course, because they're combative like this and this is their energy, the persecutor is also going to put other people on the defensive and create a world for themselves that matches their belief system and ideology. So uh, persecutors believe they need to strike first so that no one can take advantage of them. Okay, so we have to identify where we land in this drama triangle. Sometimes we switch from one role to another. In the same conflict that we have with people, we'll move from one role to another. All three of these roles actually need each other. So the victim needs the rescuer to enable them and the persecutor to provide proof that they really are being oppressed. The rescuer needs the victim to give them a sense of self-worth and purpose, and they need the persecutor to provide a villain that they can protect the victim from. And then the persecutor needs the victim to provide proof that people really are out to get them, and they also need the rescuer to provide them with the proof that no one will help them, so they have to look out for themselves above all else. How do we escape the drama triangle? It's a beautiful word called self-awareness. <laughs> self-awareness. You got to start asking yourself some questions. If you want change, if you want things to stay the same, then keep doing what you're doing. But if you want to get out of the drama triangle, you got to first identify what is the role that I'm taking on and is this serving me? Has this been beneficial for me? What kind of environment is this creating for me? Is this where I want to be? Is there something I can do to change this? What are the actions I need to do to begin taking on a new role when I find myself in a drama triangle with certain people? Mind you, the common denominator in all three of these roles is blame. Everybody is blaming, 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 because we all feel shame deep down inside goes right back to the first book of the scriptures, the first couple chapters, the story of Adam and Eve, right? It wasn't me, God. She did it. She told me to do it. We've been blaming ever since, right? That's just how it works. We blame, we blame, we blame, we blame. So as you grow in self-awareness, that's how you can begin to shift your role. And the way to move from disempowerment to empowerment for the victim is to become a creator, so instead of being at the mercy of life, you start taking responsibility for life and for the experience that you create. And so now you are choosing to create meaning out of what you're going through. You're choosing to see not new possibilities. You are the creator of your life, and so you take your power in that way, regardless of what has happened to you. The rescuer shifts to an empathizer. Okay, so the empathizer understands where other people are coming from, but they don't coddle people in their illusions. They love you enough to be honest with you. 
The empathizer doesn't create sides, doesn't make villains, doesn't interfere in matters that do not pertain to them just to feel better about themselves. And then the persecutor has an opportunity to shift into the alchemist. Uh, in the middle, in the medieval times, alchemists would transform base metals into gold. That's what alchemy is. It's about transforming the nature of something. So when you feel triggered, when you're feeling some type of way because of what other people have done or because what's happening to you in life, how do I use that energy in productive and constructive ways? Okay, emotion is just energy. And you can use it. It's about creating a relationship with your emotion. So I'll give you an example for me. One dominant emotion for me has always been anger. Because I like to please other people, there will be times where I will pretend that anger's not there, repress the anger, ignore it. But deep down inside, it's in there. And so that sometimes has caused me to Give the facade that everything's fine when it really isn't. So what I learn now when I feel anger about something, normally that's a sign that I need to speak up about something. For me, if I feel anger, how do I use that energy to be assertive in this moment? Instead of just pretending like nothing's wrong and just building up this reservoir of anger, anger, anger that one day will explode. So you have to figure out for yourself how you are going to use emotions when they're there. But that's the point of becoming an, al uh, an alchemist is you're able to transform that energy, that emotional energy, into something uh, constructive and beneficial for your life. Look at uh, what it says here in this wonderful quote by Dr. David Hawkins. He says, our higher self which we might say is the composite of our higher feelings, has almost unlimited capabilities. It can create employment opportunities. It can create situations for the healing of relationships. It has the power to create the opportunity for loving relationships, financial opportunities, and physical healing. As we stop giving authority and energy to all of the negative programs that stem from our own thinking, we stop giving away our power to others and begin to own it back again. This results in a rise of self-esteem, the return of creativity, and the opening of a positive vision of the future that replaces fearfulness. That is the empowered life. The empowered life is taking full ownership for your experience of reality. 100% of the time. Our greatest delusion is thinking that other people are always the problem instead of ourselves. When you are living in an empowered way, you become the creator of your experience because you understand that everything you experience comes from how you are perceiving life. And so you focus on shifting your perception in a manner that brings you strength and helps you find courage. To be empowered is to have the courage to be yourself, authentically you to speak your truth, to, to use everything that you go through as an opportunity for self-discovery, as an opportunity for growth and evolution. Look at this quote from uh, Maya Angelou. She says, you may not control all the events that happen to you, but you can decide not to be reduced by them. That's it. You can decide not to be reduced by them. So it's all about knowing yourself. Aristotle said, knowing yourself is the beginning of wisdom. Study yourself and get to know yourself so well that you begin to discover what your sweet spot feels like. Not just a concept in your head, but a deep feeling at your core. You know what this feels like. And you have to determine what your sweet spot is for you. I describe my sweet spot as being in a balanced centered state, at peace with myself, at peace with others, 
connected to my authenticity, in tune with my creative energies. Once you're able to identify what that sweet spot feels like, now it's just a matter of simplifying whatever you need to in your life in order to stabilize yourself there. And I use the word simplify intentionally because it's not a matter of you adding more things to your life. I have to do more stuff, which is typically how people approach this. Oh, I've gotta start waking up at five in the morning and doing this and doing that, which is fine, you can do that. Somebody was telling me they were doing that earlier today. That's awesome, I love it. But my point is you don't have to add more to your life. Sometimes you just gotta sub subtract some things. Oh, subtract, thank you. <laughs> Jenny always, helps me with, my, she's like, You're, you need to fix things. <laughs> Always after service, she's like, hey, Dr. Danny Prada, it's not a tapestry, it's tapestry. Okay, she's like, by the way, I'm like, thank you, Jenny, I love you. <laughs> so yeah, you just gotta subtract some things from your life. Simplify things to remain in that sweet spot. Your sweet spot is where you are when you are connected to your creator. And it's really that simple. Look at the scriptures. Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the spirit comes upon you. 2 Timothy 1.7, for the spirit of God does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So you don't have to try and work up this power yourself. All you got to do is connect to the power source. This is why Christ said, I'm the vine. You're the branches. Just abide in me. Stay close to me. Stay connected to me. Stay centered in me. And the power will come. The strength will come, especially in those moments when you feel like you don't know where you will access it from. You definitely can't just contrive it out of nowhere. Just stay connected to the vine and the fruit will come. You will be fruitful even in barren seasons, the scriptures say. Because that power is coming from your connection to your creator. And there's so many different ways to connect to the creator. You can individualize and specialize this in your own unique way. I, I remember I always used to uh, speak down on and talk negatively of uh, this Catholic form of prayer where you're just repeating words. You know, I guess the way that I was taught in seminary school from the, the Christian background that I had, they looked down on, you know, the Baptists looked down on the way the Catholics just repeat their empty phrases and, you know, it doesn't mean anything. We pray with energy and with power and just spontaneously and all these things, you know. So I always used to be like, why do these people just repeat their Our Fathers and Hail Marys and what is that doing? You know, I, it's so funny. Anyways, when I look back and I think about things in my life, but now that I've been working with uh, literally Catholic people every day um, in hospice, a lot of these folks are Catholics. There, there are also a lot of other things too. Um, it's funny because I work in Hialeah and there's a lot of Cubans in Hialeah. And I didn't even know that my people have this Santeria in their veins. Yeah. So it's pretty cool, though. I love it. Like, you have to be non-judgmental. You have to be an open presence with these people to provide them with spiritual care, regardless of what their beliefs are, which is, again, funny because I come from a background where it's like, oh, the Santeria, bro, get away from that. You better cast out the demon. And I've made some pretty cool Santero friends, you know? Um, anyways, we'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into that uh, later. I have a very, very interesting job, but... When I work with, with, with these Catholic patients, I was with this sweetheart this week. Oh my gosh, she's stuck in that room all day. Her body has failed her completely, but she's so sharp mentally. She's able to hold conversations. And she's like, when I, when I walked into her room, she was listening to prayers on her phone. And she's like, I just pray all day. That's what I do. I have to, I have to just pray all day. She's like, can we pray together? So I've had to learn like, the Our Father in Spanish, the Hail Mary, and, I, and I, I pray it with them. 
And it's this beautiful tool that for these people, they use to go beyond their mind. The mind is always, you know, the Buddhists call it the monkey mind. It's always jumping from one thing to another. We're always just from one negative thing to another. Right? Just negativity, negativity, negativity. How do you get outside of that? Right? Sometimes you just need to repeat some words to yourself over and over and over again. So it doesn't matter how you connect with God. You walk out in nature, you go to the beach, you go have a beer with somebody you love and connect at a deep level, you recite a bunch of prayers, I don't know, whatever it is for you. Do what you got to do to stay connected to the source. That is where your power comes from. And if there's one statement that I can give you that summarizes the empowered life, it will be the words of St. Augustine when he said, Pray as though everything depended on God and work as though everything depended on you. That's the formula. That's the formula 100% of the way. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your power that you instill in us through your spirit. Today, we open up our minds and our hearts to receive that power and strength. Help us to move out of a disempowered state and to take ownership over our lives again, to become the creators of our experiences and reality. God, we look to you, the source of our strength. Help us to remain connected to you in every moment, in whichever way we need to. God, we look to you to help us get out of the the cycle of victimhood that oftentimes we find ourselves in. Help us to build resilience, to take action, and to do the work that we need to do to shift our perception so that we can see reality as you do, so that we can see possibilities, so that we can see opportunities, and so that we can step into the fullness of of who you have created us to be. We pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. Thank you for coming. Love you guys. Have a great rest of the day. See you next week.